Section 55 of the Essays of Samuel Johnson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Essays of Samuel Johnson. Section 55. Corruptions of News Writers. The Idler. Saturday, November 11th. 1758. The desires of man increase with his acquisitions. Every step which he advances brings something within his view which he did not see before, and which, as soon as he sees it, he begins to want. Where necessity ends, curiosity begins, and no sooner are we supplied with everything that nature can demand than we sit down to contrive artificial appetites. By this restlessness of mind, Every populous and wealthy city is filled with innumerable employments, for which the greater part of mankind is without a name, with artificers whose labor is exerted in producing such petty conveniences that many shops are furnished with instruments of which the use can hardly be found without inquiry, but which he that once knows them quickly learns to number among necessary things. Such is the diligence with which, in countries completely civilized, one part of mankind labors for another, that wants are supplied faster than they can be formed, and the idle and luxurious find life stagnant for want of some desire to keep it in motion. This species of distress furnishes a new set of occupations, and multitudes are busied from day to day in finding the rich and the fortunate something to do. It is very common to reproach those artists as useless who produce only such superfluities as neither accommodate the body nor improve the mind, and of which no other effect can be imagined than that they are the occasions of spending money and consuming time. But this censure will be mitigated when it is seriously considered that money and time are the heaviest burdens of life, and that the unhappiest of all mortals are those who have more of either than they know how to use. To set himself free from these encumbrances, one hurries to Newmarket, another travels over Europe, one pulls down his house and calls architects about him, another buys a seat in the country and follows his hounds over hedges and through rivers, one makes collections of shells, and another searches the world for tulips and carnations. He is surely a public benefactor who finds employment for those to whom it is thus difficult to find it for themselves. It is true that this is seldom done merely from generosity or compassion. Almost every man seeks his own advantage in helping others, and therefore it is too common for mercenary officiousness to consider rather what is grateful than what is right. We all know that it is more profitable to be loved than esteemed and ministers of pleasure will always be found who study to make themselves necessary and to supplant those who are practicing the same arts. One of the amusements of idleness is reading without the fatigue of close attention, and the world therefore swarms with writers whose wish is not to be studied but to be read. No species of literary men has lately been so much multiplied as the writers of news. Not many years ago, the nation was content with one gazette, but now we have not only in the metropolis papers for every morning and every evening, but almost every large town has its weekly historian, who regularly circulates his periodical intelligence and fills the villages of his district with conjectures on the events of war and with debates on the true interest of Europe. To write news in its perfection requires such a combination of qualities that a man completely fitted for the task is not always to be found. In Sir Henry Wotton's jocular definition, quote, an ambassador is said to be a man of virtue sent abroad to tell lies for the advantage of his country. A news writer is a man without virtue who writes lies at home for his own profit, end quote. To these compositions is required neither genius nor knowledge neither industry nor sprightliness, but contempt of shame, 
and indifference to truth are absolutely necessary. He who by a long familiarity with infamy has obtained these qualities may confidently tell today what he intends to contradict tomorrow. He may affirm fearlessly what he knows that he shall be obliged to recant, and may write letters from Amsterdam or Dresden to himself. In a time of war, the nation is always of one mind, eager to hear something good of themselves and ill of the enemy. At this time, the task of newswriters is easy. They have nothing to do but to tell that a battle is expected, and afterwards that a battle has been fought in which we and our friends, whether conquering or conquered, did all, and our enemies did nothing. Scarcely anything awakens attention like a tale of cruelty. The writer of news never fails in the intermission of action to tell how the enemies murdered children and ravished virgins, and if the scene of action be somewhat distant, scalps half the inhabitants of a province. Among the calamities of war may be justly numbered the diminution of the love of truth by the falsehoods which interest dictates and credulity encourages. A peace will equally leave the warrior and relator of wars destitute of employment, and I know not whether more is to be dreaded from the streets filled with soldiers accustomed to plunder or from garrets filled with scribblers accustomed to lie. End note 26. Twenty-six years after Johnson wrote this Philippic, we find from the following conversation that his prejudice was still as deeply rooted, quote, the celebrated Mrs. Rudd being mentioned, Johnson, quote, fifteen years ago I should have gone to see her, Spotswood, because she was fifteen years younger? No, sir, but now they have a trick of putting everything into the newspapers, end quote, Boswell. Volume 3, page 333. End. End note. End of section 55. Recording by Pamela Nagami.